Shalom, everyone. Thank you for coming to this first meeting for learning Hebrew together. So in this first meeting, it's, we're basically doing an overview of what we're going to be learning together over the course of the study group. And so I have a few document files that I prepared in the past that I'm going to be consulting, and I may be sharing screen at certain points. We will see. But so the first thing to discuss is the Hebrew alphabet, of course, which is the, the foundational, that, that is a very basic and foundational thing. So the traditional, let you know what I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share a screen, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, this one document file is not showing the Samaritan font for some reason. I'll have to look into that. Maybe uh, for next next week, I can try to fix that because there is a special font for the Samaritan version of Hebrew, but it's not displaying correctly in my document file. So I'll try to get that fixed for next time. But let me go to the other file for you guys. So what I'm gonna be showing you all is a document file showcasing the, the different forms of the alphabet. And I'm gonna be going over that with you a little bit. Let's see here. All right. Okay, so this is a one of my document files. And so in the very left column, can you guys see my mouse moving? Just wanna make sure you're able to see that. All right, now it says participants can now see your application. Okay, so can you guys see my mouse yep. moving? Okay. So this left column is what you guys are probably familiar with. Let me uh, zoom in for you guys. Okay, so uh, this left column is traditional Hebrew that we are more familiar with. This is the one that the Jews use. Uh, I wish I could cent center this more, but uh, anyways, so the, this is the traditional, oh crap, <laughs> sorry about that. So there are 22 letters to the Hebrew alphabet, and I have them arranged alphabetically. And this second column is what's called the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet. The third column, interestingly enough, is the Greek alphabet. And you would think, why am I including the Greek alphabet here? Well, what's interesting is that the Greeks directly lifted their alphabet from the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians used for their language Paleo-Hebrew because their language was Phoenician. And Phoenician is another fancy word for Hebrew that Phoenicians spoke. And, and wrote. So I include the Greek here for comparison purposes because it helps translate the evolution of the alphabet as it progresses to the English language. Because in the, the this column right here is the lowercase Greek letters. Originally, Greek did not have both capital and lowercase letters. Originally, it just had the capital letters. And then over time, they decided to also use lowercase. And so the English also has both capital and lowercase, as you guys know. And, but Hebrew does not have capital and lowercase letters. It does have a few different forms, which I'll touch upon. 
But so I want to point you guys out to the English alphabet first. So A, B, C, D, E, okay, the first five letters. Notice to the Greek, the Greek column, the third column, it's the same letter, A and B, same letter. Now the next letter is C, also known as G. So what's interesting is that the letter C actually is derived from Gimo, which means the C letter ultimately originates from, from Gimo, the, the G sound. But over time, it became a K sound. And then later on, C also developed in English, it developed the S sound, the hard, or not the hard, the soft C. But originally C was just a hard K sound. And in phonetics, the sound of K is directly related to the sound G. The G sound and the K sound are directly related. So that's why C is Gimo. It, it actually originates with Gimo, third letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Letter D, of course, is the same. Now look what's interesting here. C, the letter C looks exactly like the Greek letter. Just the Greek letter is slanted, but it looks, if, if you were to turn the Gimo like 45 degrees to the left, it would be like a C, except it would be, it would be like this, almost like a, uh, a lesser than sign. And the same thing with D, you see with D, it's kind of like on its side. It's like, it's like rotated on its side, but otherwise it looks exactly like a D, just instead of rounded, it's pointed. And you look at E and you see the same thing. E originates from the Greek letter for E. And U originates from the Greek letter for U. And same thing with the letter V. And you know the letter W? Well, originally in older English, a W was when two U's were next to each other. But a U was a V. Originally, a V was a U sound in the older English. And so that's why the... Uh, V is also there to show you guys. And then what next in the Hebrew alphabet, I, I have a Z here and you're thinking, why is there a Z here? Well, that's because that's the order of the Hebrew alphabet. Z comes next, followed by H. Now in English, you see the H, but in Greek, look, it's the same letter, H. So that's where the H comes from. And in the Greek, H comes from the Hebrew het. The next letter is a is called tet, and in older English, let's see. Wait, hold on. There's a there's a chat. Let me see. Oh, it's, okay. Um, let's see. I was told that I could also I could also annotate. Let's see how that works. I don't know about the color. Let me see. All right. So, oh, but I can't scroll when I'm annotating. So, um, but, uh, so I won't annotate for now, but I'll try to use that uh, potentially as well. So, this letter these letters right here you, you're probably not familiar with them those are obsolete english letters that once existed in the english language they are they are the letter thorn it's called thorn and uh there was a there's another letter that i didn't include here uh which is similar to thorn and basically it has the I'm sorry, I uh, forgot to flip it. I forgot to flip it. Um, wait, hold on. All right, all right, okay. So some of these letters, that's why I'm getting confused here because some of the letters 
are actually reversed from the original pronunciations, which I'll touch upon. But so the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet corresponds to the English thorn letter and, and the Greek letter theta. But it's pronounced in Hebrew originally as just a T sound. That was the letter, that was the sound of T. Next comes the I letter in English. I directly comes from the Greek I. You can see they, they look exactly the same. And then K directly from the Greek K. And la, uh, L directly from the Greek L. Again, it's kind of on its side, it's rotated. So if you just rotate it, it's the same letter. English M from Greek M. English N from Greek N. Now the next letter in the alphabet of Hebrew corresponds to X. And interestingly, uh, the, the Greek letter is C, X-I. So that's where it comes next. And then the next letter, so I have it flipped, P and O is flipped, and that's because in the earliest alphabet lists of Hebrew, P, the letter P came before O. You know in English how it's L-M-N-O-P. Well, that's how it also is currently in Hebrew. It goes O-P, but in older Hebrew lists of the alphabet, that date thousands and thousands of years ago, like a, like did that date like nearly a thousand years before the Messiah was born. Those have the letter P come first in Hebrew, followed by O in the alphabet. And there are some passages in the Bible that also testify to this reversed order of the alphabet. So that's why I have it listed as P next. And so P, of course, comes from, uh, it also is rooted to, through the, is connected with the Greek. And like I said before, Greek ultimately originates from the Hebrew. And the letter O comes from the Greek O. And what I also did for the Greek letters is I added alternate letters or extra letters because the Greek alphabet has more than 22 letters. It has 24 currently, but it had even more in the past. English, of course, has 26 letters. So some of the letters have to double up for the correspondences. Now, the next letter I have is J because it is my understanding that that sound, that, that letter closely approximates to the J sound. Now, the, the Greek letter, uh, the Greek alphabet used to have this letter that corresponds to the Hebrew, but it was, it was gotten rid of early on in Greek. This letter, I believe, is called Sam, and it originates from Tsari. That's the Hebrew name for that letter. And then we have the letter Q. You can see the clear relation to the Greek letter Q. Letter R to the Greek R, and you have S. It's, from, it's somewhat similar to the Greek S, and T and T. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to show you guys. Well, I'm going to I'm going to go back to this page in a second, but I want to show you a different version of the Paleo Hebrew that I did in a different document. So let me just stop the share for a second and it's gonna switch to, I'm gonna switch to the other screen, which will show you guys. I, I did, I created a special, like I kind of drew on a document. And when I drew on it, I, I consulted Jesenius. Jesenius was an ancient scholar who, not an ancient scholar, excuse me, he lived in the, I believe it was the 19th century, and he wrote a grammar of Hebrew, and he did a lot of work on the Hebrew language. And 
yes, he he did his foundational grammar, and and it's it's one I definitely recommend. But it's very tedious and overwhelming with so much information. It's hard for a lot of people to to follow, and I myself find difficulty going through it because it it focuses a lot on vowel markings, which is very overwhelming. And so Smith says, uh, excuse me, Gregory says that uh, it can be gotten for free on scribed.com. So for those interested, they can uh, try to find it on there. Or we can also send someone a link if people can't find it or send them the file. So now, we're looking here in Jacinius's, the reason I mentioned Jacinius is because he gives in the beginning a history of the different scripts of the Hebrew language. And so some of the letters look more similar to English letters in certain styles than others. So I went through the style list and I sometimes picked up one style in this one letter from this style when it was closer to the English form and then when there was a a letter in this other style that looked closer to the English version then I chose that other style for that letter so I combined it to for that purpose to show to highlight the similarity of the Hebrew Paleo-Hebrew alphabet and the English alphabet. So we have the Paleo-Hebrew Aleph. The first letter is called Aleph. And look at that. It's a sideways A. Looks just like an A, it's just sideways. The, the second, the second letter is Bet. It's called Bet. And it looks very similar to a B. Not 100% identical, but very close. And uh, then you have the third letter, Gimo. And again, I, I angled it according to one of the styles so that it looks very much like a C. Just it's not curved and it's in reverse. Oh, by the way, if you guys don't know, Hebrew is right to left, and that's why uh, the, the direction is backwards for many of these letters. And what's interesting is that Greek originally was also right to left, and sometimes it was what's called budefestrin or something like that, where basically it would go, it would start going right to left, then it would go on the next line, left to right, and the next line, right to left, so it was all over the place. Uh, that's how uh, Greek was sometimes, but it was also often right to left because why? Because they borrowed the alphabet from the Phoenicians and Phoenicians spoke Hebrew and wrote Hebrew and it was right to left for them. So the Greeks took the alphabet from them. So they copied the right to left until they decided left to right was made more sense to them. So the fourth letter is Dalit. Again, it's identical in form to the letter D. It's just in reverse direction and it's and it's pointed rather than curved. But of course if someone's writing cursive or you know quick in ancient times they probably would have curves rather than just straight lines. And the, the fifth letter is hey and again looks just like it looks just like an E doesn't it? And li literally, this is, this is not me like making it, this up. This is the Paleo Hebrew. And look, it looks just like an E, except this backwards. Now you have the, of course, um, our letter. So what's interesting is the fifth letter in English is F, right? Well, Okay, so now I need to switch back to the other file for a second. Because 
What's interesting is the Greek, the Greek alphabet originally their their uh, see we, we we have this is upsilon okay uh, but there was also this letter called digamma and digamma was pronounced as a w sound a w sound but the w sound is also very close to the v sound the v which Interestingly enough, in Hebrew, in, in the Hebrew that the Jews speak, you see the letter Wa also pronounced as a V sound, both a W and a, a V sound. So you have Wa and you also have Vav. And so it's that W sound and the V sound. And why is the W connected with the V? Because if you hear the W sound, it's a W, a W, W, like with the lips. You can hear that sound. And then when you hear the, the V sound, it's a the, the, the. It's almost the exact same sound, the w and the b. And that's how it got connected. So W became V, w, b, and then V sounds very close to F. So V eventually became an F sound. W, v, f. So that's the connection between the, the sixth letter of the English alphabet and it goes it goes to the Greek digamma and then it originally it ultimately goes back to the the Paleo Hebrew uh, so okay so Jeremiah linked a file for you guys the PDF for Justinians. So if you guys are interested in, in that, you can view that. Um, so now I'm going to switch back. Okay, you, one sec, you see this right here? This is Zion. It looks like an I, right? A capital I, but that's because that's one style. But what's interesting is there is another style and that other style looks much more like a Z. So switching back, we've got, it was written like this, and actually sometimes it was written more like, let, let me annotate this for you guys. See, I, I chose the style that was much more like a Z, okay? But to be fair, it actually was more, all right, that's really small. I don't, can I change the size of it? I don't know if I've changed the size of it. Um, oh, wait, what was that? Okay, that's pretty big, but it looks like a... Um, all right, so originally, what? My computer is like, it's supposed to be black and it looks like gray for me. Oh, wait, that's because I'm, uh, that's why. Anyways, um, I gotta find something better than this, but it was more like this. It was like a, a side, like a slanted eye, almost like a Z, but not quite. The middle line was kind of slanted but in the middle and, and not not at the end. So that was the, probably the, the most original form, like a slanted thing. But then over time, some people started writing it like a capital I, and some people started writing it more like a Z. And that's ultimately where the letter Z originates from. H originates from the Paleo-Hebrew, and there was a style of writing the letter het, that's the next letter, het. The previous was Zion, and this one was wa, and that one was hey. The fourth letter was hey. Fifth was wa. Sixth. Here, excuse me. Fifth is hey. Sixth, wa. Seventh is Zion. 
8 het and so it corresponds with the letter h but of course i picked the style that looks just like the english letter it appears to be that the original style the original style was probably like what it was in the other document which is this one where it was more like a box where it had it had the middle line can you see it right here the second column it had a middle line but it also had a bottom line and a top line so it was like boxed in and then now you can see it uh it's right here and yeah like i said there was a middle line but it was also a bottom and a top line that was probably how the original Hebrew letter was, but over time they simp the, the the ones who wrote it simplified it and wrote it like an H, and that's where our letter H comes from. And you'll notice here the letter E has a little tail. That's because many times when when it was being written by scribes, they did just as we did in, in English. We write letters, and then when we finish, we kind of slide with our with our pen or pencil excuse me we, we slide it a little bit so they did the same thing in ancient times okay so i'll go back again hey do you see someone named barbara trying to get in um if somebody named barbara tries to get not yet so basically if, if if that happens i actually get a notification now now they're trying to come. do you guys hear that or is it just me who hears that i hear like an actual sound not not that i heard a sound before uh it might yeah it's probably just me i i actually changed it in the settings today yep she's in she should be in now thank you for coming on this is being recorded, so uh, if you're curious about the earlier section of this video, then on my YouTube channel, you can watch the part that you missed. But I don't want to backtrack for everybody here. So right now we're on the letter H. So we, we are... Okay, yeah, I could make... Maybe I'll do that. I'll do that starting for next week. Make someone a co-host. I'll just do it this way this time. But that's a good idea. So, um, like I said, the second column is supposed to show Samaritan Hebrew font, but for some reason it malfunctioned. I, I think this was original file was on a different computer, and then when I sent this file to this computer. The font has not been downloaded on this computer yet, I'm thinking. So uh, we were just at the letter H, where we, where this, this letter right here is the original form of, of Hebrew, the letter H, and it's called Het in Hebrew. Now the next letter is Tet, and it was like a, and there was like an X in the middle with a, with a circle or a box around it. And like I mentioned earlier, we don't have an English letter that corresponds with that one currently, but in older English, we have the letter Thor. Next, we have the, yeah, checkbox, exactly. Okay, so sorry about those technical difficulties. Again, we will hopefully try to prevent this from happening for the follow-up meetings. Okay, so, so I was sharing my screen. Let me go back there. So, 
you can see this this letter right here looks much more like a smaller letter when it's written like this way. So that's one style of the letter for I. But the other style was the other style was um, was more broad and kind of like more straight lined. So as you can see, this this is also yod right here. So the next letter comes K and that is kaf. And that was the one style that looks just like the English, but the other style in that other document had like a tail again. A lot of the letters in that other style have like a tail to the letters. So I remove the tail because some styles, they don't have a tail. So I, like I said, I picked the style for each of the letters because there was different styles of the, of the Hebrew letters in ancient times. But to, to demonstrate, to make the connection clear between the English letters and the Hebrew letters, I picked the styles that were closest to the English correspondence. Same thing with the letter L, corresponds exactly with the Paleo-Hebrew L. The letter M, it's very similar, not exact, and it looks, it's like it's upside down. You can see, it looks like an M, but upside down. And then it has that tail at the Looks like Barbara is having some problems uh, sticking to the call. But uh, so the letter N, again, it's the opposite direction. It's in reverse order, but it's the same letter. You can see the letter N in Hebrew, the Paleo-Hebrew, it is just like the N, but in a mirrored version. The next letter is Samek, and it looks just like the Greek letter C, except it has a line through it. And I have it slanted on its side about 45 degrees. Then you have the letter the corresponding to, to P. The Greek version pi is significantly closer um, looks like we got Philip on and Barbara keeps having problems so um, Melissa if Barbara keeps getting knocked off then maybe it may be better for her to listen to the recording but looks like she's doing okay at the moment hopefully she can stick up so Right now, for, for those who are newly on, because Philip is also on now, I have been reviewing the Hebrew alphabet and emphasizing the similarity between the English letters and the original Paleo-Hebrew. And like I said to everybody here, there's different styles of the Hebrew letters uh, that were existing in ancient times. But to emphasize the correspondence between the original Hebrew letters and the English letters, I picked the style, I picked the, the style that most closely corresponds to the English letter version. So that's what we're going through here right now. So I'm just gonna mute uh, your, you Barbara, okay? Because it's just giving some feedback. But if you wanna talk, just unmute unmute yourself and um or ask to unmute yourself i'm not sure if you're able to unmute yourself or not but uh but if you want to talk feel free to do so i'm just just while i'm talking the if there's any background audio from any any user then we mute them just to make it easier for people to hear what i'm saying so we just got to the section of of uh, the letter P. And now we're going to the letter O, which again, Paleo Hebrew, the same exact letter, O. And, and that letter is ayin. Oh yeah, and the letter before is pe. 
And like I said before, I'm listing it as pay and then in or P and then O and not O and P like in the English alphabet because in the, in the earliest uh, lists of the alphabet in Hebrew, dating a thousand years before Messiah was born, the letter P came before O in the Hebrew alphabet. And there are certain passages in scripture which support this same order. Okay, let me see. There's a few questions here. Um, oh, and uh, Gregory also sent a PDF of Aramaic alphabet. I'm not sure who, oh yeah, uh, I was gonna say, I'm not sure who, who made that book. And then like, oh yeah, it's probably not a book. It's probably just the Aramaic alphabet. But uh, yeah, Aramaic is closely related to Hebrew and it's the same exact letters, pretty much the same exact script actually. In fact, I, I believe Paleo-Hebrew letters was used for original Aramaic as well. Now the question was asked, do we have scripture actually written in the original Paleo-Hebrew? Um, we have scripture written in Paleo-Hebrew uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have copies. But when you say the original, it's not necessarily the original because the original would be the original uh, manuscript that once that was the first, like that was written by the author. We don't have those. We just have copies. But, um, but for most books of the Old Testament, they were actually written in Paleo-Hebrew and not the Hebrew letters that we're familiar with. Yeah, and the Paleo-Hebrew texts are fragmentary. But originally, like I said, they were all written in that Paleo-Hebrew, except for probably books like Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi. Some of the later books were probably written in the newer Hebrew that we're familiar with, the newer script. So now, We've got Sadi, which almost kind of looks like a J if you if you look at it, but uh, it's it's. Uh, I actually think J might come from the letter I when you look at the English alphabet. So that might just be a a uh, coincidence that they look similar in the form. But the next after that is the letter Q, uh, which in Hebrew was Kof. And it corresponds with the English letter Q. And Greek also originally had this letter. But, uh, oh yeah, Phil Philip knows Greek. Philip's on the call right now. And he, and he knows Greek very well. He took a college class of, of it. And so, but uh, what's interesting is that, I'm not sure how much he's heard of this, but uh, the Greek alphabet originally had extra letters and those extra letters actually come from the Hebrew alphabet. So the, the other document file has them. Let me go back to that file for a second. So the letters are di gamma. Then there's also the letter, the letter, I forget what it's pronounced as, or what the name is of it in Greek, but it corresponds to the, the Hebrew letter kof, the Q letter. And there was also the letter san, which corresponded with sadi, which originally was in Greek. But later speakers of Greek removed it because most Greek words did not use that sound, so there was no need to use that letter. If, if a letter had no purpose, they remove the letter as, uh, as frivolous. So that's why a few of the letters actually died out from the Greek, originally from the Hebrew, because Greek is not Hebrew. And so some of the sounds in Hebrew didn't exist in words in Greek. And so they didn't need those letters and simply remove the letters from their alphabet. And next we have the letter R, which looks just like the English letter, except it doesn't have the tail at the end. And it looks more like a P, the English letter P. 
but uh, it originates from Hebrew. The letter R originates from the Hebrew, it simply doesn't have that tail at the end. And then S uh, actually was, I have the one style on its side, like, like it looks like a W and it looks very similar actually to the more, the, the form of Hebrew that we're familiar with for the letter Shin. Oh yeah, and the letter before that, Resh. And then the final letter is Tav, which look, the letter T, it looks like a lowercase T with a, a cross, uh, just like the Engl in English. So that, those are the correspondence. So hopefully, going through this with you guys, Hopefully you now see, um, you guys see that the alphabet, the English letter is uh, clearly derived from the Hebrew and that they correspond. So now that we know that they correspond, we can actually have a better idea to try to figure out what the original pronunciation may have been of Hebrew. Now. I was talking with Gregory earlier and he said that I need to work on my pronunciation, but actually I have been uh, working a lot on the pronunciation and my, in recent months and the last, within the last year, my understanding of the Hebrew pronunciation has grown significantly closer to the traditional Hebrew pronunciation that we are familiar with. But I wrestled with it because I was trying to reconstruct the correct pronunciation. But as I studied more and more, I came to the conclusion that traditional Hebrew that we're familiar with is much more in closer to the original uh, pronunciations. And so, uh, let me go back to that file again. So I'm going to give you guys my understanding of the uh, pronunciation, and I'm going to try to approximate it again to the English alphabet. And the reason I'm doing this is so you guys can, uh, can see that you can see the clear connection. So you can say, oh yeah, I pronounce it this way because that's the English letter. It helps you con convert a foreign, if for me, the Hebrew letters are not foreign because I've been looking at the Hebrew letters a long time. But for those new, if, they haven't, if you haven't really been familiar with Hebrew letters and how they look, it can be confusing to see a foreign script. But this can make it easier for you to make the connections when you, when you connect the English letter to the Hebrew letter. So going to the chart again. So what we got here is the first letter. Well, I'm, I'm gonna skip the vowels at first and go with the consonants and then I'll go back to the vowels. So the first consonant here is bet. Now, originally I was suspecting that the, the pronunciation may have been a P and a B, but I have come to more be inclined that it's a B and a V, just like the, the just like uh, Hebrew speakers currently also speak it. And the reason is in many languages, B and V is considered sibling sounds because they are closely connected in the mouth. So you have the B sound, B, uh, and then you have the B sound, B. The, the lips move in such a way that it's very similar and therefore the sound is similar. I was thinking prior to this that the original sound of, of uh, the letter was a, a uh, B and a P sound. So it would be, because B and P sound very similar too. B and P. Like for example, if you say the word lobster, lobster is with a B, right? Well, place a P in, instead and you have lobster, lobster. It sounds very close to lobster. But as I've been studying more, it seems like instead of a, P and a B, like I thought, it would be a B and a V. And by the way, each of the, 
each of these pronunciations, okay, Steve's coming back on now. He got knocked off, which I can't fault people for being knocked off since I myself was knocked off. But so each of these letters, you're gonna notice some of them have two le uh, letters or sounds. The first is the, the one that's uh, listed first. And then the second one is I put in parentheses. And that's because each letter has two sounds depending on how and when and where they are used. And so the most common thing that I have seen is that there is a, it's based on syllables. So when it, when it begins a syllable, it's going to have the first sound usually. When it ends a syllable, when it ends with that in a syllable, it's going to have the second sound. So you have, so you have like, the, the word for father is av, because it ends, the syllable ends in the letter bet, it's going to have that softer sound, the B sound. But um, when it starts, when a, a syllable starts with the letter bet, it's going to have a harder sound, a b. So you have the word for son, ben, and the word for master, baal. It has that b sound. It doesn't have the v sound, the softer b. It, and it makes more sense to start with start strong and then as you end the sound, as you end the, the word or the, the, the uh, syllable, you then kind of throw down and just kind of relax, relax it. So mm -hmm. that, that kind of makes sense the way you think of it. So there's nothing special about the third letter, G. It's always going to be a G sound. Same thing for D, always a D sound. There's no special rules. Like I said, I'm skipping the vowels. I'm skipping the vowels and um, I will, I'm not gonna skip them, but I'm gonna skip them for now and come back to them after I do the consonants. So we have Zion, which is a Z. It's always a Z sound. There's nothing complicated about that. Now this one, Traditional Hebrew uh, puts it more of like a like a like a Bach sound, like with a, like in your throat type of thing. But I believe it's it's more the traditional sound of an H, just just a hard H sound like house and and uh, hope. You know, it's a huh, huh, but it's just the H sound, not a so that's I, that's a diff, that's one difference that I have uh, between traditional pronunciation. Next, we have tet. Now, originally, because it corresponds with Greek theta, I thought originally the th sound was for this letter. But as I started studying more, it became apparent to me that actually, just as Hebrew speakers render it, it is a t sound. It's not a th sound. So it's always going to be a T whenever you see that. So that's why the, the Hebrew word for good, originally I was pronouncing it as thob with a th sound, but now I pronounce it like, like the Jews do, tov or tov with, with a V sound at the end and with a T in the beginning. Next, we have the K sound, uh, the, the cough, which is K, and is nothing complicated about that. Next is L, again, nothing complicated about that, just the L sound. M is M, N is N, nothing complicated about these. Then the next letter, I thought, because of the Greek letter, the Greek letters seem to be reversing things sometimes. The Greek letter is a C. It's not the letter S, it's a C. So I thought maybe this was the letter sh or, or ch, 
but it's actually what just the way the, the Hebrew speakers do it. It's just the letter S. It's just an S. And, and it's that simple. Now, for the letter Pei, I originally thought it was F followed by V because F and V are very similar in sound. F and V. So if you're saying fox versus vox and laugh versus laugh, you can see, you can hear how it's so similar. Well, also P and F have a similar sound and that's why uh, they, they are connected. So a similar sound, uh, so for example, the, the letter is P, like P, 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 and the F is a F, F, F. So sometimes when I've been actually talking, I've said one sound and I think to myself, that sounds just like the other letter. So over time, as I've been thinking about these things, I've actually noticed that a lot of these pronunciations, I get confused all the time sometimes. Barbara, did you have a question? Let me unmute you for a sec. Uh, oh, looks like I... Oh, I just yeah. figured out how to get... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I was thinking of, you know, with the P sound and the H sound, I was thinking, you know, how many words we have, like prophet, where we have the PH. Right. Yep. And I noticed, you know, like years ago, I started learning German and I noticed a lot of similarities in the German and the English, but there were the letters you're talking about. I noticed reversals like, uh, uh, well, I found out in a book in Bookman's, um, there was this huge language book and it showed a chart of where languages came from. And it said that English came through Old High German from Hebrew and um and so it made sense to me learning the German because like words like meaning hot is heiss and I was like okay it starts with the H and the T I noticed so many words that reverse the S and T in the German and um anyway sorry didn't mean no, to interrupt that's okay. that. It was kind of it was kind of exciting when you were talking about that because it kind of reinforced what I had learned. Yeah, well, it looks like Gregory dropped for the moment. We'll see if he comes back on or not. Although he told me he prefers shorter meetings, so who knows if he'll be back or not. But uh, we'll see. I was going to ask him about the. He mentioned a book called Origin of Speech of Speeches. Um, so okay, so let me just say my view. I actually don't think German is connected to Hebrew in the way that some, like I've seen some people make this claim, but what I can say is that ancient German may have borrowed some Hebrew words. And actually it probably goes back to the Indo-European. So Indo-European is considered the ancestor of all uh, what scholars classify as Indo-European languages. So German and English directly go back actually to original Germanic language. And the Germanic is descended from Indo-European, they believe, potentially. But uh, uh -huh. it, what seems to be the case is that there was an original Indo-European language which also used Hebrew words occasionally. And, well, hold on, Jeremiah has to go. So, all right, uh, thanks for coming on and hopefully you listen into the rest of this recording which will be posted on youtube um so but yeah so that that is uh the and they may have been influenced by hebrew at an early period and there may be substantial influence but they're not derived from hebrew so that's an important distinction to make I guess Jeremiah just didn't like my assertion that uh, German doesn't come from Hebrew. I don't think he liked that. <laughs> but uh, so did you have one other thing you wanted to ask Barbara or say? And if so, then if not, then we will uh, go back to the 
teaching. Okay, so why why do you oh, think Melissa. that? Do you really think they care that much if it if German came from Hebrew? Does it uh, really have relevance? I really think that it might have. Do we really know? I want to really look into that. That's so interesting. Um, it's it's just a matter of trying to be correct in in his in history. It's not like mm -hmm. a you know it's not it's not a uh, necessarily a salvation issue. You know it's not like you're in sin uh, if you believe one way or the other. But you know we're trying we want to make sure we don't s uh, believe or teach others falsehoods. And I have studied language in general like. So I try to focus on Hebrew, but I also studied language rules in general and language like over like, like general rules of all languages. And my studies of language in general tells me that those languages are too different to be derived from Hebrew. But the, at an early period, there was substantial interaction with different languages, just like today, English, you know, English borrows from all these different languages, right? Mm -hmm. Ancient languages did the same thing. That's very likely why there may be some foreign influence. Welcome back. Um, we were just talking about German and whether it, it originates from Hebrew or not. I was telling them that German may have been influenced from with, from Hebrew at an early period, but that in my understanding, German doesn't actually derive from Hebrew. And that's what you were just wrapping up. And now we're getting back to the alphabet. So oh, did you want to say something on that, Gregory, or no? I couldn't tell if you were going to say something. But. Um, okay, so so we're going through the pronunciation, and we were we left off with pay, and so like I said originally, I thought it was a f and a v sound, but lo and behold, I've actually come to conclude that the that the Jews are right all along, and that the pronunciation is both a p and an f, and so at the beginning of a syllable, it has a p sound. And at the end of a syllable as an F sound. So that's why you have Joseph. It ends with an F, Joseph. Of course, it's not a Joe, but I'm just simplifying it for you guys. Joseph. And then you have a P sound at the beginning. So uh, I can't think of too many words that start with the P, but um, I know there's P. Penuel, but I'm trying to think of a better a better word. But anyways, you get the idea. So um, now the next letter is a it's Sadi. Now scholars have debated what this sound is. Typically, you'll see it rendered as a T S or a T Z sound. So it'd be a S, -S or a Z Z. But it doesn't, it doesn't really approximate to things that we are familiar with. But over time, as I've studied, I've actually come to conclude that I think it actually uh, it relates to the J sound as well as a, a ZH sound. So the process that I've been doing for the reconstruction of the pronunciation of the alphabet is that the original alphabet of Hebrew had to cover all the so sounds in a harmonious way that made sense and didn't repeat let it didn't repeat sounds for different letters. It was one, it was unique sounds for each letter and no repeats. And it was that was my thesis or or um, hypothesis. And so there's this letter Sadi. So it can't have any sound for any of the other sounds. 
but I was using the other sounds as a guide to figure out what the sound could be for Tsadi. So I'll go to that in a second. So next I want to jump down all the way to, to the letter Shin. Scholars say that it's sometimes an S sound and sometimes an SH sound. I believe that's inaccurate and I think that's a simplification. I used to think the letter was solely an S because of the Greek. The Greek, it's always an S. It's a sigma. So I thought, okay, it must always be pronounced as an S sound, a S sound. But like I said, as I studied more, I came to conclude that the pronunciation that the Jews have is much closer than I was doing. And that, oh, and one of the things I was supporting that S sound instead of the, the way the Jews are doing it is because there was that passage in scripture which talks about the, the sibilet versus the shibboleth and how the sounds were, were reversed depending on which group was speaking. That's a passage from the book of Judges, so I thought that may be a basis for it. But, uh, so, but like I said, sounds can't repeat in my view of the original language. That could be wrong, but I'm of the view that the original rules of the pronunciation had no repeats for any of these letters. So, the letter that, that the sound of S is already taken up. It's it's in sigma. Uh, I'm excuse me. It's it's uh, not sigma. It's in a samic. Okay, that's already taken up. The I see the hand raised. I'm going to hit you in a second here. Um, but so that means the letter shin cannot have an S sound. It has to have a different sound. But it has the SH sound. I believe they are correct on that. So what I've included, it has the ch sound. Like, you know, cheese, church. I know you guys love that word, church. Many people in the Messianic movement love that word, of course. Um, and I'm being facetious there. But uh, so the... I believe the original pronunciation of shin was both a ch followed by a sh, or I should have it consistently. Consistently, I would have it like this. So when it starts a syllable, it would be a ch sound. When it ends, it'd be a sh. So um, Supporting for that is, you know how some words, sometimes people pronounce it with a s sound and sometimes they pronounce it with a sh sound. Like Sabbath, some people pronounce it as Sabbath, some people pronounce it as Shabbat. And again, the th at the end, Sabbath or Sabbat, you'd be Shabbat or Sabbath. The, the final letter is a tav. Why is it pronounced as a t and a th? Sometimes some people speaking it pronounce it as a T, others pronounce it as a TH. Why? I'll explain that in a second. But for the Shabbat and, and Sabbath, why is that the case? Well, guess what? If, you, if it's a CH, CH sounds very similar to the sound S. So you have, if you have a Sabbath, now pronounce it as Chabbath, Shabbath. It sounds very similar, not exactly, but over time, you know, language changes over time. So I believe that sound ch became an S. So um, like the word, the name Shem, in the Greek, it's pronounced as Sem, but I think it's originally pronounced as Chem, and it has like a it, it, it's it's much quicker so that it's like a it can sound like an s sound and same thing for seth some jews pronounce it as shet so it would be it would be cheth with a ch and for solomon it'd be it'd be a ch child Solomon, and samson champson okay so it's a ch uh, in my view. Would it be Kodesh or Chodesh? Which one is it? Okay, well, so Kodesh, uh, I believe, I have to check again, but I believe it's with the, with the cough. So, um, 
if it ends in a syllable, it would have the, the, the sound in parentheses in my list, in my view. So what's in parentheses is what ends in a syllable if it ends with that sound. So it would be SH, Kadosh, with the SH, not, not CH. And the same thing applies to the last letter, Tav. It's not the letter T and sometimes TH. It's actually the letter DH and TH. It's the letter, it's the sound th and th, th, th. So when you, when you, when you have, uh, you, it would be Chabath, like that, that's Sabbath, Chabath, or Chabath. Um, but the, the, the sound is that, is when it starts. So, uh, Tubal Cain would be, would be, so Tubal would be Thubal, Thubal. And you can hear that the the, the is, sounds closer to a T, to a T sound. The versus a th. And also, interestingly enough, you've heard people speak with lisps in English, probably. So, um, or like Japanese speakers sometimes say things funny compared to the way you're supposed to say it, right? And so, um, some speaking, you know, people were talking about German earlier. In German, you actually say, instead of saying Sabbath, you say Shabbos. You end it with an S sound, Shabbos. And why? Because S sounds similar to the TH sound. So like, uh, yeah, you know what? If you my say thick my versus sick, thick, thick, oh. sick, see, sick, thick, it sounds very similar. Uh, with and with, 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 uh, cheese. All right, so we have cheese and we have cheese, cheese. It's like someone with a lisp talking, it sounds similar. So that's actually where the German Shabos, it, well, it comes from uh, Yiddish, and Yiddish is a, a combination of German and, and Hebrew. But that's why, because over time, these sounds get confused. Um, so I know this was supposed to be an overview of Hebrew, but we kind of uh, just mainly been sticking on uh, on pronunciations here, but that's okay. Um, so the other thing to talk to touch upon is the vowels. Now, traditionally, people tell you that there were no vowels in Hebrew; it's all consonants. It's a half truth. It, it's actually both. So. The letter A in English hat was the vowel A in Hebrew. Same thing for E, same thing for I, Yod, same thing for I N, O, and same thing for Wa, U. Okay, but in English, A has a bunch of different sounds. It, it can be a A, A, A. So which one is the correct pronunciation? It, it, it's the short version. It's the short sounds. So ah is a longer form. A, again, that's a diphthong. So the, the sound is ah, ah. And for, for the E sound, you can have, for the E letter, you can have E, you can have A, you can have E. Eh. And again, it can't be a diphthong. So E is eliminated, A is eliminated. Oh, wait, e, e is actually uh, not a diphthong, but it's, um, it's connected to a different letter. So, but the letter that best fits hey is not ah, like many people render it. Like, you know, you have, um, like whenever you see hey in a Hebrew word, typically it's rendered transliteration with an ah, Yahuwah with the A-H, and Yah 
Y-A-H, but it's actually more accurately an E, because again, that's the letter E. It, we showed earlier, it corresponds with the English letter E, and I argue the sound also corresponded. So just the word egg has that E sound, egg, the E eh sound. And the U has the O sound, like moon, June, the month June has the O sound. The, the I has the E sound. It's not I, that, that's a diphthong. And it's not I, but it's E. And we've got the letter O. Um, the, one second, please. All right, so the, the O, I thought originally was O, but I've actually come to learn that, that, I, that, that the O sound is a, a uh, diphthong. The o is a long sound. It's actually the short. And so the original pronunciation for the letter O in Hebrew, the letter ayin, for the vowel is an O uh sound, like ugly, but to correspond it, to the letter O, it's onion, like, you know, the food onion, O-N-I-O-N. -O the, the letter O appears twice in that word, and it has the U uh sound twice. On-yun. On-yun. And so it has that U uh sound originally. Let me see, there was a few, let me see if there was uh, any messages here. Um, I had another question, if I can remember it. I'm just looking at the messages, making sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, so, you know, you can call it alphabet, but alpha comes from Greek, and that's, the, the Greek letter is alpha, and they call it alpha because that's derived from the, the, the Hebrew, and the Hebrew is aleph, so. Mm-hmm. Is there a Hebrew for dummies? I may need that. <laughs> well, the idea is this is the introduction and then we're gonna review this stuff over time with some exercises. So. I kind of read something that was on your uh, screen there and it's kind of off topic, but I wanna try to remember to ask you about it later. It says something about secret words or secret symbols at DSS which I should just say Dead Sea Scrolls in case people don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I saw it on your page there. Which page? I, we're at the end. It just showed the very top where it says at Qumran there was... Oh, right there. <laughs> No, that, that, that's that's too secret for you. You can't see oh, that. I need to know. Oh. Don't be keeping secrets. Um, so, so the only thing here... Okay, so I'll, I'll just share it. So this is a document I wrote a long time ago, so some of it needs to be updated. But um, basically, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were what's called special cryptic or secret scripts. And basically, they made their own new scripts that s scholars have never seen anywhere before. So and it was letters or words? Letters. Okay. Yeah, so they, they wrote different letters to mean the Hebrew letters. So they had a code? Kind of like a code, potentially. But it could, it could be just their own style of, of script. We don't know. It's some speculation by scholars. Wow. But some which believe it was like a, a code. Do you know? Say it again? Do you know which cave that was found in? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. But most of the scrolls were found in cave four. So it'd probably right. be K4. <clears throat> um, no, uh, the Atbash cipher was developed by the Jews after the switch. So they don't have the, um, they don't have that. The, uh, the pay first followed by IN. So yeah, the, so the, for those who are reading the comments, Gregory mentioned the care and the Khatib or the Khatib. And so 
the care is it's saying how to read it and the Khatib says how it is written. That basically means that some words in the Bible are written a certain way, but the but there's a variant, and the variant is preserved by how you might need to how you might read it, perhaps with a missing like with a different sound of different vowel. Um, but so the at bash thing, I don't think was in the Dead Sea Scrolls though. But anyways, yeah, so the Dead Sea Scrolls has some of those secret scripts, interestingly enough, but only for a few scrolls. It's not for a lot. I believe it's used for some of the calendar texts, the secret script, when they do a, a, a huge uh, list of their calendar stuff. So, all right, let's see here. All right, so you're going to hear people talk about how originally it was just consonants. And then they'll say something like, there are all these like guttural sounds that are so hard to pronounce. But I've, as I've studied over the years, I've come to conclude what these guttural sounds are. So Aleph, listen to the ah sound, the, the ah, the ah sound, the ah. When you just say the sound ah, and you're just saying it naturally, it's very faint, but you can almost hear like a k sound at the end. Ah, ah, apple, apple. That has a kh sound at the end of the vowel. So when it's used as a consonant, it has a k sound, kh. When Ayan, so ayan is the is the uh sound, okay? Uh. Um, I'm sorry. Let me think here. Um, oh yeah, okay. So ayan has a uh sound, but when you hear the uh sound, if you listen closely, it sounds like there's a a consonant at the end when you're saying the vowel. Uh, 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 uh. It has like a GH sound. Uh, uh. So it's a, it when you're using it as a consonant, it's a GH sound. Uh. So for example, the word the names so, for the Sodom and Gomorrah, the city Gomorrah, it's actually the letter I in. And I believe it's the Samaritans, they they pronounce it as I think they might pronounce it as Amora, but the Jews pronounce it as Ramora, Ramora. It's that GH sound. So the best way to understand the distinction for the guttural sounds is when it's a consonant, Aleph is a R sound, R, and, and Ayan is a R sound, GH. And now when do we use these uh, consonants versus a vowel? When when, when the letter precedes a vowel sound, it must be a consonant. When it comes after a vowel, it must, um, wait, okay. When it comes after a consonant, excuse me, when it comes after a consonant, it has to end in a uh, vowel. But it can also double. It can be both a vowel and a consonant because it flows. And like I said earlier, when you say the vowel, it sounds like you can hear that consonant at the very end faintly. Ah, uh. So when you have like, I can't think of an example at the moment, but when you have a vowel the, the vowel followed by, like, okay, let's see here. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I'd, I'd have to actually look up some examples to make it clear. But um, so the let the, the sound for e has a faint h, uh, eh, eh, 
sound like so it's similar to the h for het but it's a softer h so you know like how some people say uh like herb herb the h is almost silent herb 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 but it's very soft almost silent so same thing with like honorable honor you know honorable honorable it's a very quick h um sound so it's the, it's the weaker h sound but you can hear that h sound when you're saying the 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 vowel as well eh eh soft h and so same thing with the, with the letter wa try you, you try saying the oo sound oo oo you can see that it ends in a W, ooh. Just naturally saying it, the W ends the vowel, ooh. Same thing with the, with the E sound. It mm -hmm. ends in a Y when you're saying E, E. So if you're saying mamma mia, you know, when you're saying that E, uh, you're not adding a Y to it. You're literally just flowing the I sound, connecting it to the next letter. Ia, Ia. And Ua, Ua. It flows because it's the same sound. You just hear it better when it's jumping to another vowel. So now the, um, the reason I conclude it's a J and a J sound because look, there's a pattern here. We're seeing, we're seeing a, a harder and a softer, right? B, beginning a syllable, V, ending the syllable. Hard, soft, B, V. Same thing, P, V, uh, P, V, right? Again, we have V, Th, V, Th. So it, what we hear is they, like I said, harder uh, and then soft. The, the. And so we hear we have ch, sh. So to compare, so it'd be a ch, sh. So it'd be like a, like a, uh, almost like a t c h, ch, sh. Then we have, we have the same thing for Z. So just like we have a, we have a S here and a SH, SH, TCH, CH, SH, CH. We also have a Z right here. So it makes sense for a corresponding harmonious pronunciation scheme, but there's also a ZH sound, a Z, like the English word measure, I'm measuring something. It ha it's, not, it's not messering. I'm not messering something. And I'm not measuring something with a Z, but je, like a, it's a flowing je. But just like in French, you have je m'appelle, bonjour, you know. <laughs> and so it's a je sound. And, but what's the harder sound? Just like you have ch, T-C-H, you also have D-C-H. J, J. So when it starts a syllable, it's a J sound, and that actually sounds very close to T-S, 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 right? T-S, T, or T-Z, T-S, J, J. So that's my basic pronunciation scheme here. Um, there's also diphthongs. So if two, if a, if a, a diphthong is formed when the a vowel, which is a aleph or a he or an ayin, is followed by a yod or a wa. So aleph wa, you have the a u, ow, a u. It sounds like ow because that's because it's a diphthong. It, co it combines together to form a single sound. Ow. And eu is. Oh, ooh. It's, it's like a uh sound. 
Oh, like the OO in good. Uh. And the OU, remember the O is a us sound. So OU, 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 it's an O sound. That's the, the sound O, the, the long O. It's a diphthong, like cold. You're actually saying, you're saying it quickly, but you're saying OU, OU. And um, Aleph followed by a yod is ai, ai. So it's i, it's i sound. And the, the hey followed by a yod is ai, ai, a. And the ayin followed by the, the yod sound is a oi, oi, oi. It's, it's like joy, you know, the, the oi sound. And we're going to probably have to wrap it up because it's approaching the, uh, the time. We can go a little bit longer because we actually started a little bit later. But uh, I don't want to really exceed the two hour allotted time that we said we would do. So... Um, that leaves us with something, though. Um, what do we do? Let me see if I can annotate here. Um, what do we do if we have three consonants? Like in Hebrew, the word for king is, oh, man. Hold on. Oh, okay. I can change it. There we go. I'm still learning how to do some of this. Yes, uh, Gregory put it in the Hebrew in the chat box. I'm putting it in the English letters just to convey to you guys. M L K. Okay. So, how do you pronounce it? There's no vowels there. So, Jews added vowel markings later on, they did not exist originally in the Hebrew language. But Dead Sea Scroll writers also added vowel, sometimes they added vowel letters to convey the sounds, even though the vowels weren't originally there. Uh, yeah, you, if you guys want, you can include your email addresses. Um, and then I can send you guys stuff that you're interested in. But uh, so what actually is going on here is there's two sounds that are going on when there, there's two syllables. So the first syllable, so I, I told you guys all the different complicated vowels, right? But there's two vowel sounds we didn't cover. And remember I said sounds can't repeat in the different letters according to my philosophy. So where are these two other sounds? Where do they, where do they go? These two sounds go between consonants and they are unwritten. You don't, you will never write the sounds unless you're using the vowel markings or what's called meter lectionus, I believe it's called. And that is using vowel letters as these silent, uh, these silent sounds or not the, the, these unwritten sounds. So almost always the first sound in a word, in a syllable, excuse me, the first syllable, if there's two consonants, it's going to have a ah sound. Sorry, bad writing. I don't write well with the mouse. Okay, that's supposed to be a letter A, a lowercase a. And it's not an ah, it's not an a, but it's an ah, like ah, interesting. So it's an ah sound because that, the sound ah was not listed in any of the things I presented so far. So that longer sound comes first, and then the softer sound, the quicker sound comes next, and that's it. That's the is sound, like pig and quick, the is sound. So it's malik, malik. 
that would be essentially what it is. But Jews, are, like you'll hear some people pronounce it as Melek, Melekim. Um, and what you'll see often is E is confused with A by the Jews compared to the original Hebrew. So you have a you have an E sound followed by a, a quicker E, melek, but the second E is kind of quicker, almost like an I, melek, melek. So just keep in mind that whenever you see E in a Hebrew transliteration, transliteration means writing in English letters. So uh, like for example, Elohim, it actually uses the letter A, Aleph. But typically, it's, it's rendered with an E, okay? So now, it may, you may decide for yourselves that it's preferable to use the more standard form that the Jews use. Because it actually, in many ways, it feels, it feels right. Like, like, uh, when you see, when you're trying to sp spell Elohim, it just feels right to spell it with an E, not an A. And if you're spelling it with an A, it just seems wrong to do it, even though originally that's what it would be spelled with an A. But just because it's been E, it's been rendered E so long and so much, you may find it preferable to render Aleph as an E sound and to render Hey as an A sound or not a sound, but a letter. So depending how you guys wanna use Hebrew in your life, do you wanna speak the original Hebrew that, that was spoken by the original speakers uh, way, way, way long ago, but then it died out? Or do you wanna speak the Hebrew that was current in the time of the Messiah? Or do you wanna speak the Hebrew that the Jews are speaking? But even if you're gonna speak the way that other people speak, you still want to understand the original rules and concepts of Hebrew. So all what we've done today is we have we have shown the uh, overview of the pronunciation and the alphabet. There's so much more depth to the Hebrew language that we're going to be covering. But like I said, of course, we are running out of time, so we will stop shortly. But uh, so, okay, so here's an example. So the word Edom, Edom, okay, is spelled with an Aleph followed by a Dalit. And whoops, that's a long, big Dalit. Uh, I need to make that smaller. And again, this is not Paleo Hebrew. This is uh, the more Hebrew, the traditional Hebrew we're familiar with. Okay. So now, originally in Hebrew, Edom was spelled Aleph, Dalet, Mem. But you're going to find often that it's also spelled with a Wa. All right, Barbara, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, hope you enjoyed it and it'll be recorded. So you can check out what the parts you missed. And I hope to see you next week. We'll be doing this every week, Thursdays, 8.30 to 10.30 is the plan. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, Gregory said that Mem Lamed Ka, which means king, also has all sorts of variations of meaning relative to rule. And we will get into that. That's actually the whole study of roots. And roots are very interesting. Again, I wrote this terribly. I'm trying to write the letter Wa here. Okay, so I just added a Wa there. Now that is what's called a mater lectionis. And that, that is a vowel letter added by the Jews that wasn't originally part of the word. Same thing with the name David. This right here is the original form 
of the name David. But later scribes, including in the Bible and some copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they add the letter Yod. So now they add an I here. So it would be Dawid, Dawid. Both are pronounced the same. It's Dawid and Dawid. But some scribes decide to add the Yod to convey that there's that, that is sound. Same thing in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You've got, for Moses, you're going to see, gonna, you're going to see Masha, okay, Masha, or Mo, Moshe, okay, but it's a Masha, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's spelled some often with a Wa, so the Wa is can be you know depending how you pronounce it it can be an o sound an oo sound or an a ah sound because it it's a w it can be a w the consonant right so so masa would be spelled with a wa or without a wa same thing with elohim traditionally elohim is spelled without a wa, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it often is spelled with a wa right here. Okay, sorry, I messed that up. But uh, yeah, in Solomon uh, is Shalama or Shalama. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it is spelled occasionally as with a wa at the end here, and sometimes it has two wa's. And I've seen in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Isa is ayan, yod, I believe it's yod. No, it's not yod, but sometimes in the Dead Sea Scrolls it is. Um, Think. And then I, I have to check again, but I think it's Ayan, Shin, Wa. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, sometimes it adds the like Aleph here. Anyways, there's all these different uh, things here. So now let me stop sharing. Um, I'm going to check that device that you're talking about. I'll, I'll look into it, Gregory. Uh, uh, special device, we'll, we'll check on that. So anyways, uh, a, a long overview of, of pronunciation. But that's just, that's just the uh, pronunciation stuff. But uh, there's just, like I said, there's so much more depth to share with you guys. Um, I do want to share this at least one more thing with you, and that's going to be there's something special about the number three in language in general. And I believe the original Hebrew or the original language, the perfect language, if you will, had three as a, as a principle. And I'm going to show you guys what, why and what, what the implications of that are. So let's see here. I have it in a document file. So, so I wrote in this document a long time ago, the Hebrew language read from right to left has a tri tripartite, which means three, fold division encompassing the entirety of its grammar. That is for each type of grammatical item, there are two other items that form with it a complete group of three. And when I said the Hebrew language, I meant when I wrote this, the original Hebrew that I was trying to reconstruct, the, the perfect Hebrew that I believe once existed. That's what I meant when I wrote this. Um, because the current Hebrew and the Hebrew that we know of doesn't have all these things. But so if you look, 
For each type of grammatical item, there are two other items that form with it a complete group of three. They are always as follows. Inward direction, outward direction, and both. Both inward and outward. So let's take a look at these threefold divisions here. So for nouns, there's parts of speech. I mean, excuse me, for, for words, there's parts of speech. There's, there's nouns. What's, why is a noun an inward direction? Because a noun is an identity. So inward, because it's identifying, it's being identified to itself. It's bringing into itself its identity. So that's why it's inward. It's a noun. A verb is an action, something that some noun is doing. So because it's doing something, it's outward. So it's verb, it's out. The verb, I'm verbing. A noun is verbing. A participle is a noun and a verb. So it's both. So it's a noun and a verb. Now, a noun can be singular, so one, which again is, is um, inward. Plural is many, and dual, dual refers to two, like a couple. So it's a, it's like a, it's a small unit, it's two forms of couple. So it's, uh, it's like a single unit, so it's like, it's a, it's inward because it's a couple, but it's outward because it's two, there's two. And then you have for gender, feminine is submissive. It's receiving, it submits, you know, it's, it's submitting. So it's, it's bending over to receive and uh, it's weak, it's weak. So it's inward, you know, weak, vulnerable. Masculine is strong, dominant, it's forceful, it pushes out. It dominates. Neuter actually comes from, it means neither, but typically it's used in languages often to mean both. It's both, it's something that pushes out and in at the same time. So it's neither, it's neither, it's neither masculine or feminine because it's just, it's just uh, itself that it, it's like, like an object. If you're just referring to an object without any uh, relationship intended, it's just itself. So a rock, it's just a rock. It, 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 it's, a, it's an identity, but it's also conveying meaning. So it's both. Um, now, person, when, uh, so if like you're saying I or we, first person, I, also uh, plural, we or us, referring to us or me, right? Inward. Second person is outward, you or you all. And then third person is, is both inward and outward. It's, it's uh, he, he, because if you're talking to me, like, so let's say you and I are having a conversation. If, if I say I or we, it's inward because in our conversation, it's inward because it's referring to myself. If I'm talking to you and I say you, I'm doing something, I'm saying something outward. But if I'm having a conversation with you and we're talking about someone else, it's, it refers to both me and you. He is he to me and he is he to you. So he is conveyed to you and to me at the same time. Therefore, it's both. Same thing with they and same thing with she. It's they for you and me. It's, it's uh, she for you and me. And voice you have passive voice. Passive is inward, just like feminine. It's weak and re receptive. Active voice. And you have a middle voice. Middle, because it's both. Mood is indicative. 
Um, it's like a regular form of a verb. It's indicating something, identity again. Imperative is a command. It's telling something else to do something. And infinitive is just a base form that is applicable in both directions, I guess. I, I can't explain that one the best way, but yeah, it, it's basically both there as well. Conjugation for verb is the regular conjugation. Causative is um, causing someone else to do something. So regular verb, you're doing something yourself. But in Hebrew, there's something called a causative verb. So you causing someone else to do something. Reflexive, you're causing yourself to do something. So it's inward and outward because it's reflexive. Case is nominative. Nominative means subject. So nominative is the subject of a clause. So it's the one who's doing the, the verb. So the nominative noun is the subject of a, a sentence. So it's the inward, it's the subject. The object is what's receiving the verb, but it's from the perspective of uh, the verb. So it's object, it's the object. The subject comes in, the object goes out. And genitive refers to possessive, and it's both inward and outward because it's um, genitive, so it's of, but it's outward because it's of something. And then tense, in Hebrew, there's tenses, and for verbs, there's imperfect, so it's it's inward because it's it, it's still still ongoing, still happening. Perfect is it's already happened, it's done with. And aorist, it could be both perfect and imperfect. There's no specific tense, so it's both. So as you can see, there's a threefold uh, in language in general, but Hebrew for some reason, apparently does not have the neuter gender. So it may very well have been that originally Hebrew did in fact have a neuter somewhere and that it got lost very early on. Same thing with the dual. We have evidence that dual once existed in Hebrew. There's a few archaic forms of dual that survived, but it was much more extensive in the older uh, sibling languages of Hebrew. Uh, let me see the time here. Um, Okay, we're pretty much near the end. So let's just, uh, do you guys have any thoughts of what I've said? Anything interesting you want to give feedback on? Oh, there's a bunch of stuff said here. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Hey, brother. Uh when you go back over the recording, are you able to see the links? Because I'm gonna, I'm, I, gonna I'm gonna double check I that. It. I I don't know. Um, if uh, I can't see them though, I actually did a setting where I can say I saved the, the chats, and actually, I think awesome. That'll I work. think I turned it on that you guys can save the chats. So if you if you click the three dots, you can. I think it should let you save the chat for yourself. Yeah, but it only goes back to like whenever I rejoin. Oh, right. Well, like the one before, or whatever. Okay, but so out. it's 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 not going to, like, I fill out near the beginning, so I don't have the beginning stuff, but everything after I have. But right. it's possible the whole thing was saved in a copy the way I set it up, because I okay. set I set things up earlier today. All right. Um, Thanks. That's all I got. All right. Uh, anyone else? Uh, anything you want to say? Oh yeah, the the book uh, 501, 501 Hebrew verb roots. I actually have that book as well. I haven't really opened it in forever, it's sitting on a shelf over there. But that's a good book uh, to recommend. I think though it does actually it does go into modern Hebrew, but much of the modern Hebrew 
words are the same as biblical Hebrew. Modern Hebrew is, of course, different. Perhaps I'm wrong in that, and Gregory might be able to correct me on that, but I think it's modern Hebrew. But the verbs of modern Hebrew are roughly the same. Most of them are the same uh, as biblical Hebrew. Um, let's see, what else are you doing here? Okay, modern, oh yeah, you just said modern Hebrew. Um, so wait, are you doing, are you doing, Gregory, are you doing modern Hebrew or are you doing biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew? Uh, we have uh, three hours of classes um, in the middle of the week. Um, Whoops, M Melissa's audio is interrupting. Hold on. I'm going to mute her for a sec. Just All right. Yeah, uh, we have three hours of um, that we work on of modern Hebrew. We kind of half and half it um, with the 501 Hebrew verbs, the barons text. And um, the um, now the the uh, text that we're working on for modern Hebrew uh, that can be that can be purchased through Google Books. I don't know if you if I if you can give me um, screen share, I can show you what it looks like. Uh, but it's it's very very good. It'll get you right into the modern Hebrew um, without the Nikud, which is very useful for studying Palo because Paleo because the sooner you drop those Nikud, the better off you are. Um, so check, uh, you might be able to share without me even giving you permission. Check, check to see if you can share. Let's hear host disabled participant. Oh, it, it says I've, it says I've disabled it. Um, oh, yeah, maybe it's because I'm sharing. That's probably why. Uh, let's, let me stop sharing. Let's see if that works. Okay. Does it, does it open or no? Uh, no, you'll have to right click on my name under the participants and, and add that, that permission. Um, I'll have to check on it some other time. I, I can't see it at the moment. Um, wait, hold on. Let me see. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure right now. Oh, you said participants. Let me see here. Well, let's see if this works. I'm making you co-host. Does that give you ability? Yep, yep, that does it. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, Hebrew, modern, uh, modern Hebrew for beginners. This also comes with a lot of sound files, which are very useful. The sound files, so you can hear native speakers speaking this. It helps you with your classical um, paleo because they're, it's, it's quite close. And basically when you open the book, um, you know, here's an idea of what it looks like here. Of course, this we're we're quite a ways into this book, but I mean, from the beginning, it's uh, looks like this. And this is used at the University of Texas um, by um, a professor there. And it was uh, my son, my firstborn son, Elijah, is actually more advanced than I am. I I'm somewhat humbled oh, wow. to say that. But he lives in France, and he's he's right in with the Jews all the time. He's constantly uh, learning, and he's just started a Semitic languages um, course, a master's course in Hebrew, Semitic languages, at the university in France. Uh, so this is, um, you know, uh, it starts out very basic, um, you know, with just some vocabulary, and pretty soon it starts to drop those pointings off for you. And it does give you the the olive bet, uh, some of that kind of stuff, some basic um, kinds of things, and then it gets to the first chapter, which is essentially uh, the uh, vocabulary, chapter one. There's quite a few. Uh, there's quite a too few. In other words, it, it it does assume that you don't know very much, you know. Right. So that's pretty good. Uh, we've been using it. Uh, I've got a, a um, someone that studies along with me, and uh, uh, it's very helpful, I think, for the sound, the phonetic. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, so um, the what I think eventually we will do 
is I think I'll on one of these times I will show some of the vowel markings that the Jews use and kind of just uh, point out how you pronounce these different ones. But uh, there's so many different rules of when to use the vowels according to when they say and stuff, and it's all over the place. So it's much simpler to actually learn Hebrew without the vowel markings. But I think it's important to be able to recognize the vowel markings and know which sound is being in that word. Uh, but I don't think you need, when, when you're writing Hebrew words yourself, I don't think you need the vowel markings and it actually makes things way more complicated. Like Jesenius, when you go through Jesenius', Jesenius book, 80% of it is vowel, mar like how to write the vowels correctly in like all these different things. It's crazy. If you remove all that stuff, you're going to shorten the book significantly. And I think it would actually make it easier to learn for people if they weren't overwhelmed by all the, with all that tedious vowel marking stuff, which wasn't even in part of the original language to begin with. Um, but we'll touch upon it in one of these uh, lessons. And also, I will be talking in the future about the importance of related Semitic languages in our understanding of the original Hebrew, such as Arabic, uh, Aramaic, and Akkadian. Very important, those three languages specifically. And maybe touch upon some Ethiopian as well, and putting it together and showing how Hebrew actually is corrupted from the original Hebrew, the original Semitic language uh, that Abraham spoke, that Moses spoke, is very different than the Hebrew that the prophets and David spoke and Solomon. In the time of the judges, Hebrew rapidly changed. And so, like, if you look at the history of English, Old English was around 1100 AD. And by the 1500s, it became modern English in just a short time span like that. 500 years, basically, 400, 500 years. So uh, the same thing, I believe, happened with Hebrew from the time of Moses to the time of David, like a 500 year period, basically. Hebrew basically deteriorated from a complex language like Akkadian to a very simple and corrupt language of Hebrew that was preserved by the Canaanites and Phoenicians. And I'll touch upon that history more in the information supporting that stuff in future, in the future lessons. And what's amazing is that like stuff like Akkadian and Arabic, they have extensive vocabulary that's the same as Hebrew. It's like thousands of words that are the same roots the same exact roots. It's just amazing, mind-boggling uh, stuff. And uh, pronunciation changes and uh, sound differences that cause actual changes in the word in the letters being removed occurred in Hebrew and other languages like Akkadian. And we'll touch upon that perhaps possibly next session. So I'm not sure the way we're gonna do the first lesson, because a lot of the stuff I was sharing today is good, would be good for the first lesson. Um, so I'm not sure the best way to present things for the first one, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, I'll try to plan over this week and we'll see what comes next Thursday. And do you guys have any further thoughts uh, or any comments on what we've discussed today, anything interesting that stuck out to you that you didn't know before? And yeah, Philip said Shakespeare's Hamlet in the original, very different than uh, the English we're familiar with. Uh, Gregory said, cross-referencing helps us understand the primitive phonetic. Yeah, that's exactly, that's why I focused so much on that in the beginning. I wanted people to make that clear connection. It doesn't look like anyone has anything they want to say. I'll give you guys like a, another minute. Any, anyone want to say anything before we go? 
We should learn one word each week. You should tell us a word. And we should try to remember it by the next week. Do you, do you think that's a good idea, Gregory? What do you think about that? She say uh, learn one word. And she said, I think she said uh, learn at least one word. Okay, well, sure. Um, you, I, I have no problem with that. Um, there's several ones. Uh, usually uh, what I do is my aim. Uh, uh, when I start out students with learning vocabulary um, shortly, but uh, you might have one that you might want to put down there. Maybe if next week we'll start with fool, the next week ignorant, following, stupid, you know, we'll, we'll have, we'll, no, I'm just joking, but uh, I'll, I'll try that's to. Oh, no, that's <laughs> the wrong, that's the wrong. I, I, that might be Aramaic, actually, but uh, so, um, but I'll try to think of some good words to learn and. Um, can you elaborate? Uh, Steve was saying uh, bring food and call it out. Maybe, but I know what you're saying. I'm just confused by the the exact wording you said in my in the message you sent me. Bring food. I don't I don't get what you mean. Bring food. But um, oh, you're just saying like we we would uh, bring food to the meeting and then like using it as a prop, I think is what you're saying. Uh, okay, so I actually was thinking after the first meeting or maybe starting with the first meeting, what we'll do for the exercises would be, um, what we're gonna start doing is identifying, tra transliterating the English letters. All right, Gregory, See you later. Thank you so much for coming on. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned some cool stuff. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so what we're going to do uh, is basically, we're going to start with um, Paleo Hebrew, I think. And then we'll work to, to the Hebrew we're familiar with in the Bible. And basically, um, we're going to try to identify the equate the letters um, with uh, the English letters. So that's going to be in the second half of the meetings for exercises in the beginning. So if you if you guys are not familiar with those letters, wait, let me see here. How many people are familiar? With the letters, so that they could see Paleo Hebrew and know I automatically which letter goes with that. If not, then that's important to do the exercise. But if everybody already can associate it easily, then we don't need to do it. But and for those who know it already and have basically mastered it already, it may not be a valuable use of their time to sit with us as we go through that so they might leave during that portion and that's fine um but i think it's important for those who are new to hebrew to um to really identify to be solid in identifying the english correspondent to the hebrew and what what we'll start with is i the the letters themselves then once we have that down for the exercises we'll then as exercises we'll start doing sound uh sound uh syncing so what that means is basically like if i'm typing if i'm typing uh in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth if i'm doing the 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 letter syncing, I would type it as in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But if I'm syncing it by the sound, it'd be like, um, it might be the same in the beginning, but then it'd be like in the B, 
Kinning. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Um, All right, so yeah, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So it'd be something like that, where it'd be kind of comparable in the sense of you're trying to spell it, you're trying to sound it out. So the first one, you're trying to identify which letters are which English letters. And then for later exercises, you'll start to identify, yeah, no center cat. <laughs> you start to identify which uh, sounds these Hebrew uh, letters are. Then when we have that measured down, then we can move on to the other concepts in the grammatical exercises. But while we're doing those practicing stuff, we can introduce new concepts in the lessons. So we'll, we'll learn new concepts, but our, our practices, our exercises may be on, stuck on former lessons we've learned because you, if you learn something, you really want to like get it down. So you may have to repeat it multiple times. So we're probably going to be repeating a former lessons multiple times in exercises while we're learning new stuff. I think that's the best way for us to learn. Um, so like I said, first half, be the lesson. You guys will get stuff out of it. And for those who feel like they don't need the practice for any given week, if you want, you can leave at that time. Or you can just enjoy the show and watch people make mistakes and laugh at them and have a good time. But uh, anyways, thank you so much for attending this first meeting. We had a good showing. I think it was eight or nine people at for a while. Appreciate it so much and hope to see you guys next week. If you can't make it in future meetings ever, it will be on YouTube. And so I encourage you to keep up with this series and I hope we will learn Hebrew together and become fluent and try to become masters in the Hebrew language. I already am, just kidding. <laughs> you didn't know. God bless you guys. I'm gonna stop the recording.